Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, January 7th, 2016, and this is the week in charts. This week's webinar is brought to you by me. I sold myself some advertisement here. I'm having a special, and part of the reason is because the market is so bumpy, and if I say so myself, I think I put out a lot of good information in my service as I see these things developing. And I'm going to talk a lot about those things in just a few minutes. But right now I'm having a sale for 2016. For the first quarter of 2016, trading service is 50% off, okay? And that's a teaser rate, but you get three months at least. And then after three months, if um, you want to stick with the longer term, I'll make you a good deal on longer term subscription too. By the way, there's a disclaimer screen. I can quickly sum it up by saying all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Uh, quick announcements. Um, if you want to check out the trading service without any financial commitment or anything, uh, you could look at the free version of it, which is the uh, what I call foresight in hindsight. And that's a pretty cool thing simply because you can look at what it's saying and then you could actually look at that stock today and see if it took off or see if it worked or, or, or not. Or, so it's kind of a warts and all type of thing. But it's a great way to get started for free. And this is in the sidebar of my website. The blog is over here. I hate the word blog. I call it my article usually. But the sidebar has a lot of good information, including my podcast. So check that out when you get a chance. Um, given the development situation, I thought it would be important to stay mostly with the charts. I do want to talk about the capitalization problem of indices and I think that's kind of a an interesting thing and it's vitally important I want to show you how important that is and why it's important we still have some sell signals still in place we'll talk about those abandon a trend and then I want to go back to what I've talked about before how rats leave a ship and that'll make a lot more sense in a few minutes um, once we get to the charts I'd love to know what stocks you like and what stocks you would like me to opine on that's the right, right way of saying it, give you my opinion. So um, love to know them, but just uh, if you don't mind, wait until we get to the live charts, just so I can answer anyone's questions um, first, and we don't get a lot of stock picks uh, in, in the question uh, bar. But then once we get to the charts, feel free to ask about as many stocks as you want. Also, uh, if you don't mind, just ask about one symbol at a time. And this is for your benefit, because if you have six symbols, in a list, I'm just going to pick one or two so I can get back, so I can get to everyone else, and then I might forget about the rest of the ones, so I have no way of tracking them. So just put a symbol in and hit return, and then we should have plenty enough time to get to it. No problem, Deuce. No problem. Okay. <laughs> this, obviously, this picture's taken a little while back. I was a little bit leaner then, I think. Uh, is it time to say hello to my little friend? Well, a while back, way back last September, or actually, I'm sorry, way back last December is what I meant to say, when I did the last chart show of the year, I went back to the charts. And I think it's important to go back to the charts whenever the market is in a developing situation like it is now, especially when it's beginning to roll over. Um, one thing that's interesting is we had this weekly bow tie going back to late last August and early September. And a bow tie, I don't want to go into too many details. You can get the report, the free report off my website under um, products and then click on, uh, let's see if we could pull that up. I'll show you that in one second. But if you go into products on my website and you go to free reports, there's a report on the bow tie. And if you want a PDF on a bow ties or something, I could certainly send you the chapters, but I think it's in that. It's it's definitely on the free reports. And we're just looking for a, a moving average, just a 10 simple, a 20 exponential, a 30 exponential. And I also like to use this 50 for reference. So this is just a 50 simple, by the way. And I'll show you why I like that in just one second. But one of the main reasons I like to use it with the bow tie is you get an angle of inflection. And if you get a sharp angle against the 50, then usually it's a pretty serious new 
downtrend developing. In other words, it's a pretty serious top because of the velocity of, of the market coming into the 50. It's kind of uh, a bit surprising in this particular case. We came in really sharp at a 50, but the market took its own sweet time to top out. So the point I'm trying to make here is this signal is going to remain in effect until and unless this top here gets taken out. These highs get taken out. And I'm going to talk a lot more, more about that in just one second. Uh, one other thing, too, since we're on the bow ties, sometimes you get what I call a second mouse signal. You'll get a bow tie sell signal, and second mouse is the uh, saying, the early bird gets the worm. But the second mouse gets a cheese. So sometimes you get these first signals as a false one. Market will go on to make uh, marginal new highs or even brand new highs, and then you get that second real signal. The biggest um, one that I could ever remember in history, I think, was in the Euro in like 2007 or 2008. I forget exactly when, but I've got the I've showed the chart many times, and I think that was my first trip to Italy, my first trip, my first experience. Uh, it might have been first trip to Europe where it was my first experience with uh, with a, a euro that was like twice as much as a dollar. And um, as my wife said, we're bleeding euros. Uh, it was ridiculous, but then that turned out to be the major top. So sometimes when you get these second signals, now this particular case, we don't have a second signal. We have a second signal on the daily chart, which we'll look at when we get to the um, actual charts. So that signal remains in effect until and unless that high gets taken out. Now, I've shown this chart a thousand times, and those of you who, who know me are like, oh, geez, um, not again. But for those of you who weren't familiar with the pattern, and even if you are, it's probably a good refresher. We had a bow tie way back at 00 on the sell side. We had one in 03 on the buy side. We had one that was a buy, okay? This was a sell in 2007, 2008, early 2008. And then we had another buy back here in 2009. And as I said before, this one was a little late to the party, but as you can see, the market did have a pretty good run, even though it was a little late to get in. By the way, keep in mind that I prefer to look just look at a blank chart first and foremost. And indicators don't actually indicate anything. Indicators simply just illustrate what's already in the chart. So the bow ties help to show you that a market may be rolling over. But even if you took this bow tie out here, okay, let's say you take this indicator out here, you could see, oh, yeah, the market is kind of rolling over. But sometimes it helps you to see. And this is especially true when you have a trend that kind of does like this. And if you look at it at longer term, let me fix that, a trend that looks like this. If you look at it at longer term, your eye tends to see this, this big uptrend here and you might not notice this and but once you put the moving averages in if they're crossed over you're like oh yeah it is beginning to lose some steam now one thing i was thinking about and i often say is that everything works better with trend it's the slope of hope so i'm all proud of my bow ties but if you just put a 50-day moving average and this is just a 50-day simple and in this particular case because this is a weekly chart, this would be a 250-day moving average or a 50-week, just to keep it simple. So this is 50 weeks, which would equate to, if I'm doing my math right, a 250-day moving average on the daily chart. So this is a 50-period moving average. But you can see we had this beautiful – let me change my pen color, I guess, make it a little bit uh, – we had this beautiful – uptrend back here that began in the late 90s and the point I'm trying to make is if you just follow the slope of the moving average notice that this moving average higher higher headed higher it headed higher for a long long time so something as simple as a moving average could really help to keep you on the right side of the market and another concept I'm just kind of thinking about now that I often use is daylight. And daylight just means that the low of the price bar is higher than the moving average. And you have daylight in here. There's a uh, gentleman from the Bronx, 
from the Bronx who read my um, first article I wrote for Stocks and Commodities, ironic, ironically, back in 1995. And uh, oops, what happened there? Um, and he dubbed the, tor the term daylight. So there's light between the, the lows of the bars and the moving average. And then conversely, on the downside, when the market begins to roll over, the price will jump below it. And there's daylight to the downside. And this is based on a, a simple little trading system I, I uh, developed and published in Stocks and Commodities. But you can see we have daylight to the downside here, too. So that's another simple concept. But the point is, something very simple will work really well once a trend begins to develop. And then even if you did wait a little bit, even though you'd be a little bit late to the party, you could wait until you have a pretty solid slope in these moving averages and then look to get on. So the point is that we are losing slope fast, very fastly, fastly, very fast in the um, in the moving average. Now, this is a monthly chart. And this sort of uh, illustrates what's really happening now in this market. And uh, the trend is your friend until the nasty bend in the end. I, I Googled the trend is your friend until the bend in the end, and uh, Sakota came up. So we'll give him credit for that. And the point I was making recently, and especially now, it's, it's especially important now, if you look at, this could be hard for me to draw a horizontal line, but if you look at the close, of, let's say we close where we are now, and you go back in time, you could see that you can go back a long, long ways before you actually have a, a higher close. Now, these are monthly bars, okay? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. You know, that's well over a year and change, like a year and a half back, especially now that we have this recent little slide in place. So sometimes when you're looking at a market, again, you just kind of see this big blue arrow here, or in this case, because it's purple. Uh, and sometimes you fail to see what's going on here, and that's where bow ties and things like that. And just quite simply, net net change. Always ask yourself, where is the market today? And where was the market a week ago, a month ago, a year ago? And sometimes this net net change could really paint the picture for you without uh, plotting 15 or 20 or 30 oscillators, okay? Any questions on anything so far? And again, if you want to know more about retail, uh, retail uh, uh, bow ties, I don't know why I said retail. Uh, if you want to know more about bow ties, you could check out the, um, I guess maybe it's in my retail store. Check out the, the free reports under, um, under my store on my website. Let's see if we can pull that up real quick. So if you did go to... It's just right here on the website. If you go to products, free reports are the first thing on the um, on the products page. And what I'm doing is I'm giving giving away all these free reports, but don't worry, I'm making it up in volume. So I'm, I'm a pretty good businessman, following that uh, internet model going back to the uh, to the 90s. All right, I want to talk a little bit about uh, mass mass by capitalization. Okay, uh, Phil asked an interesting question. What would the 50 MA equivalent be on the monthly? Well, the monthly is roughly 20 bars, and some would argue it's a little bit closer to 21. In fact, let me do the math on that. There's, there's really about 250 trading days in a year by the time you take out everything and divide by 12. So, yeah, it's 20, probably 21 would be the average, but I just use 20 just because it's a nice round number as my monthly uh, uh, or when I'm talking about a monthly moving average. So on a monthly, it would be, let's do the math on this, 20 days would be each period. So a 50-day moving average times 20, 50 times 20, would that be 1,000? I think so. Yeah, so it's a 1,000-day moving average <laughs> on a monthly, okay? And that, you know, what's funny is we were in a, um, I was at a, uh, an APTA meeting once, American Association of Professional Technical Analysts, and we, we put in a 500-day moving average. Now, that's going to have lag out the wazoo, but it is kind of interesting, which I guess would be the 50 on the monthly. And let me just show you what we were doing. We were just trying to see how long 
you could stay with the trend by doing that. And it was pretty amazing. It was kind of fun stuff to do. So that would be like a, this would be a 500 day moving average, which would be a 50 day moving average on the monthly. And you could see that if you use the concept of daylight, you'd stay long for a long, long time. And let's back the chart way out. And we were kind of, we were just kind of messing around with it. And we were, we were going, it would, to our surprise, you'd go for like years and years and years and stay above or below that moving average. So it, it all comes back to everything works better with trend. So there's your 500 day moving average. Obviously, tremendous amount of lag to that. But if you were just following that moving average, I mean, look at this, go all the way back to the 90s. Okay, let's say you got long in the 90s when it crossed above that moving average back here. It just kind of rode it out. You know, it gave it a little kiss right here, but then you can see that longer term trend continue. Now, I'm not saying you should trade off of this, but what I'm saying is you could use these type of things to help keep you on the right side of the market. Okay. So, yeah, it, but the further out you go, the more lag you're going to be get. And anytime you use an indicator, you're going to get more and more lag, obviously. Now, one of the things I was messing around with this morning, and I've been thinking about quite a bit lately, and I've, I've been talking about this for months, actually, is that the indices are kind of masking what's really going on underneath the hood. And then we get to the live charts here in just one minute. That's going to make a lot more sense. And I've been showing you this ad nauseum, but I'm going to show you again, because now it's beginning to unfold, it's finally beginning to make a little sense for some of you guys. So... One thing I did this morning was I, I plotted the S&P 500, uh, which is the capitalization weighted index. So that means that the, the bigger the stock, the more important it is to the index. And the smaller the stock, the less important it is to the index. In fact, I don't want to digress too far, but a lot of these people out there who, who, are, who are fund managers, and nothing against them for doing this, but what they'll do, because they know their ass is on the line to be pretty much in line with the S&P 500, and they claim to be uh, these uh, stock pickers or whatever, a lot of them will do, what they'll do is they'll just buy a small basket of stocks that'll keep them in, in the S&P 500, an equivalent of the S&P 500. And you could do that with a very small basket of highly capitalized stocks. And then for their quote unquote stock pick and they go out and they pick a few little stocks here and there. And it's probably inconsequential, uh, inconsequential. Uh, it probably doesn't make a big difference to the performance one day or the other, but they're going to be guaranteed that they stay in business. So, you know, nothing wrong with that to each his own. And, and I don't blame them. Okay. If, if, if I was in a situation where I was put under a microscope and, and, and under someone's thumb and under clients, expectations to to be in line with the S&P 500 and I had hungry kids at home which which I do by the way um, they won't stop eating damn it uh, <laughs> then maybe I would do the same thing you know you want to try to you want to try to like stay in line and you want to keep your job so they could just buy a small basket of stocks now what's interesting is if you take the unweighted S&P 500 and this is what I use this is the RSP I use this uh, for tracking purposes for my momentum list, which I call my Landry 100. And every stock here, it here gets equal weighting. When you look at the charts, they don't really look this one. They don't really look that bad compare them when you compare them side by side. But it's interesting if you go back to the top around 519, and I think this is a weekly chart. You could see that the S&P 500 base is the spider. I want to use an ETF for this. So it's kind of like um, apples to apples. It's down 6% and change. But if you look at the unweighted index, it's down nearly 10%. And if you do the math on this, it's 40 something percent, nearly 50% difference between the two. So the average stock is down about 10% as opposed to the what the S&P would suggest by being only down 6% and change. So it's vitally important you pay attention to this. Now, we fast forward to today's action, 
uh, a few minutes ago, literally a few minutes ago, I put this chart together right before the show. So we get current data. We're down 7% since that uh, May 19th close, okay, on a net net basis. So seven, let's just say seven and a half percent. And if I do this relative strength sort based on the 500 components of the S&P 500, what that's going to do is for whatever period I chose, in this case from May 19th to now, it's going to show me what stocks are doing the best and then if you scroll way down, it'll show you what stocks are doing the worst. And then obviously you could also, you could always flip this sort too, if you want to do that right here. But what's interesting is if you look at the big, big winners, Amazon, that's one of the biggest companies in the world. Netflix is pretty darn big. It's up in here. Okay. Hormel Foods, that's still pretty big capitalization. And then that's also a food stock. We're going to talk about that in just one second, which is a defensive type of issue. Um, you can see Google is one of the biggest stocks out there. And I don't know why it's uh, – they have, I guess, Class A and then this other one. But e even, even this one here is still big. I guess they're changing the name or something. And if you even come down further in this list and look, there's Facebook. Facebook is a huge stock, okay? So the point I'm trying to make is some of your biggest winners in here have very high capitalization, okay? So the index is being propped up by these stocks. And then in a few minutes, we'll take a look at some of these, if we have time, to show you what's going to happen when they begin to fail. One of the, the most blatant, I think, examples ever when it comes to capitalization was Apple. And, and, and it might still be to some extent, but Apple was close to about 25% of the NASDAQ 100, okay? So that one stock makes up nearly one-fourth of the entire index. So if Apple begins to implode, as it has, we can take a look at that too, then it's going to take down that entire index. So that one stock can appear, well, not just appear, it could actually take down an entire market when you have an index that's capitalization weighted. So if we take a look at some of these stocks in just a few minutes, you're going to see the importance of capitalization and how a capitalization weighted index can mask what's really going on and it reminded me of this slide that I put together a while back and I've done a column on this in the past and it's it's how rats leave a ship and I find that or I have observed that when things begin a little dice begin to get a little dicey the, the smaller cap issues are usually first to go, okay? Now, I don't want to talk out of both sides of my mouth. Sometimes I've seen that super-duper speculative issues, such as IPOs, and once the market begins to crack a little bit, can still do okay. But as a general statement, your smaller cap issues are usually the first to go. What just happened with the indices? The Russell 2000 rolled over first, okay? And what happens is you get this bit of a flight to safety to these to these larger cap stocks, and people begin to look more for substance, okay? And then in that process, it's like people then move one step beyond and move towards more defensive issues because everybody still eats – in a bear market and, and not to be crude, but everybody still poops in a bear market. So it's like food and uh, consumer non-durables, such as toilet paper, obviously, paper products, personal products. There tends to be a flight to safety towards those so-called defensive issues. Now, I wrote way back in Layman's in 2000. Good Lord, I'm getting old. Was it 2008 or nine when that came out? I forget. 
it might have it might not have been published till 2010 right after the bear market but I made some interesting observations uh, playing around my little relative strength tool here and my point is there's not always a bull market somewhere. I would love to be able to just swap over into these defensive boring issues and just sit on them and gradually have some capital gains occur during a bull market, but it just doesn't work that way and because these areas will go down too eventually. The keeping with the boat and afloat analogy a rising tide lifts all boats. So it's always better. Everything works better with trend, right? So it's always better to be long during a bear market. Unfortunately, when the tide begins to go out, all the stocks will eventually sink. It's very hard to find those few stocks that can defy gravity. Now, I do take things, and I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent, imagine that. But I will take setups if I really, really like them even if we're in a bear market, okay? Because if there's some stock that's doing really, really great, it's kind of like jewels and Pulp Fiction, you know, that would have to be one effing charming pig. So if, if the stock can super duper, looks super duper great, it's a fantastic setup and it can defy gravity, then it might be worth taking. But for the most part, you're not gonna find those type of setups in a bear market. My point that I think I'm trying to make here, <laughs> I hope I'm making, is that, if the market does sell off hard, all stocks are going to get hard. Now, this kind of dovetails in with this capitalization thing, okay? Because these large cap and these defensive issues are going to be high in that list. And like I just said, the Hormel, that's a food, okay? Notice it's high up in this list. I was doing some uh, messing around this morning, and I noticed that um, – I forget the stock's name, but they make Oreos. It's, it's, it, it's, I think it's a foreign health company. It starts with Medellas or something, okay? And also, if you look a little bit at this list, we have, what is this? That's a tobacco company, right? And then you have a beer company and a, co and a, um, a Dr. Pepper is in here. By the way, I'm beginning to wonder if he's really a doctor or not. Uh, what else in here is defensive? Tyson Foods, okay? So some of the best performing stocks in here are defensive in nature, okay? So that's that's somewhat of a concern. So I think that this rats leaving a ship thing could be playing out here. Now, we talked about this in the last show a few weeks ago, so let me just run through this real quick but I think it's very relevant at this point in time. And then we'll get back to the, um, we'll jump into the actual charts and I'll show you some of these things in real time. So we talked about Big Dave's major top and bottom catcher and six easy steps. And step number one was to wait for a major new high or low. Step number two was to wait for the bow tie. And then this could even be a first thrust or some other transitional setup, but you get the idea. Step number three was to trade it. Step number four was to place the stop above or below that bow tie. And if not stopped out, take partial profits along the way and then begin to trail your stop. And number six was to enjoy. And this is the S&P going back to the last time we had that major bow tie sell signal. So step one would be wait for a major high. In this case, it was an all-time high. Step two would be wait for the bow tie sell signal. Step three would be to short the market when it triggers. And step four would be to place a stop above that all-time high and go about your life and relax. I know, haha. -ha. Now, that might be tough to trade by putting a stop that high up. Unless, of course, you're trading at a small size, a very small size. But it illustrates a great point, and that's kind of like what happened in the P's recently, at least so far, is that it hasn't taken out that prior high. So if you did get short here on that bow tie sell signal, so far you'd still be short. Okay. Now, I know it's tough to trade like this, but it makes a great point 
And at least, even if you're not trying to capture these huge big picture moves like this, which I know could be tough, at the least it helps to keep you on the right side of the market. When the euro topped back in 08 or whenever that was, when bonds topped a few years back, when gold topped a few years back, any major bear market or bull market for that matter, this pattern will play out. Now, obviously, not every signal will turn into a major bull or bear market, but it's important to pay attention to these signals, and it's important to keep this concept of the new trend is in place until that high or that low is taken out. So, obviously, if we take out this high here, then this longer-term uptrend remains in place. But if we begin to sell off, until and unless we take out this high, the downtrend remains in place. Now, notice that I put trail stop in there. So we're not going to go back to like a year like 2008 and say, oh, okay, we're short, we're short, we're short, we're short, we're short. We're not going to stay short until we get these signals at all. I'm, I'm sorry, until it takes out a new high. We're obviously going to trail our stops along the way and take some profits along the way. And then if we get a new buy signal, then we start thinking about whether or not we should be long again, okay? So it's very important to, and I'm not making dramatic pause, I'm just trying to get to my, my slides. It's very important to pay attention to when you have these major sell signals. And again, until that old high is taken out, that sell signal remains in place, okay? Even if you get stopped out of your trade, when you go to put on new trades, you say to yourself, self, maybe I better hold off on the long side because that sell signal is still in place. And that's why I've been preaching since last summer that this market is in trouble, okay? I predicted early, but I didn't predict often, okay? That's what a lot of people do. They predict often. And I'm getting a, my inbox is getting flooded with all these top pickers in here who have been <laughs> wrong for a long, long time. Wrong in that they think the market's going higher. And it's kind of ironic as soon as the market rolls over. Ah, I told you so. Well, I saw this back last August, and you can too. I'm not saying that I'm the only one that saw it, okay? Anyway, so until the top is taken out, again, the top remains in place. And this um, – if you go back to August and September, I have some YouTubes out there, and that's why I keep leaving this slot, leaving a slide in, and a week to it, or two weeks in this case. Um, so go back and go and check those YouTubes, and a lot of things that I talked about uh, are in that YouTube. Now, STC is booze. Oh, is that a booze? Like a drinking booze? I'm not sure what other kind of booze there is. Okay, uh, let me just hop out into the charts. I want to show you some of this. Uh, relative strength analysis and capitalization and stuff. And then again, um, if you go to this link here or you go to my Cyborn website, you can get on the service on a delayed basis. Um, I do answer all emails for those of you who are new to the show. So if you have a question or something, feel free to email. Now, within reason, obviously. Um, there's only so many hours a day, but I will answer all emails. And a lot of times, uh, be prepared for me to send you to um, some YouTubes and uh, give you some articles to read and things like that. But once you become more and more educated, then, uh, of course, I'll be happy to answer any emails or any questions you may have. And any time I do a course, by the way, I do um, give that course lifetime support. All right, let's get the um, – Let's get this relative strength, uh, strength thing up and running. In fact, I think it's still in here. That's a blank chart. And one second. Talk amongst yourselves. And, yeah, if you guys want to start talking about individual stocks, you could do that now. I should, be, I should have enough room in the chat to see them all. Okay, so I did this relative strength sort a few minutes ago. In fact, let's do that again just to make sure there's no uh, – confused or anything so let's go back to way back to may and let's sort the stocks to see what's going on if i could find the window it's masked here here we go all right so since uh may 19th i think it's where we were down seven and a half percent we click okay 
and it's going to sort this window out. And we could see that we have these big, huge cap stocks over here. There's Amazon. NVIDIA, it's still a pretty big stock. Uh, TE, not so much, but that might have been a buyout or something. Activision. Now, this is a food stock. Now, what you have to remember is the bigger they are, sometimes the harder they fall. So when these stocks begin to crack, I think the market could be in a lot of trouble. And I think that's the point I'm trying to make here. And here's another food stock, okay? It's, it's actually doing pretty good today, okay? Flight to safety, I don't know. Uh, I don't want to pick things apart on a one-bar basis, but it does look like it tailed higher and came back in. I'm sure the candle people are all over that. That's a fat man on a shooting star or something. Uh, you do – one thing I have noticed a little bit, you do see a uh, – what's this? What's the uh, Italian saying? Something per terra, invest in, invest in rock, uh, Petra, or rock or whatever it is. I'm, I'm sure I'm ignorant. <laughs> but you do – I am seeing a little bit of real estate doing okay in here. Uh, inspire the overall market. So maybe some people looking for tangible items. Uh, this is a tobacco company, okay? Uh, people still smoke in a bear market. People might even smoke more, okay? Sometimes drugs could be a bit of a flight to safety type of stock, at least for a while, because people still take drugs in a bear market. And then here we have uh, Tyson, which is another food company. Doing pretty good, okay? I, I can't argue with that. I wouldn't buy it because it's lost momentum, but doing pretty good. There's a beer company, and then somebody said STZ. Was STZ in this list? Yeah, right there. Constellation Brands. That's booze, okay? Yeah, we just looked at that one. Okay, brain fart. Sorry. Anyway, so a lot of these stocks are highly capitalized and can make a huge difference. Let's just take a look at Apple real quick. Uh, Apple, obviously, is beginning to crack in here. So if we take a look at the Qs, we are talking about this a minute ago. So what did the Qs do? The Qs are beginning to crack. And these highly capitalized stocks, or these high cap stocks, have you want to look at them, are going to, when they begin to fall, it's going to really drag down this index with them or any other index. <laughs> okay, Phil says pharmaceuticals are the leading industry sector today. Okay. Yeah, so you don't necessarily want, you know, getting back to SS sheep dip, you don't want to – you can end up chasing your own tail. And, and you know, it sounds wonderful on uh, these – these. I don't want to pick on any of them because they – I might not get invited back. But these television shows that talk about markets, and it's wonderful to say, yeah, you know, we're going to buy a bunch of drugs because drugs are going to do better if we have a bear market. That's fine, Okay. But the reality is, if the market does roll over in earnest, you better have a chair for when the music stops. And uh, thank you, thank you for that, Phil. I appreciate that. Okay, so that's your. Uh, let's see if we could do. Uh, let me just show you real quick my nightly analysis in five minutes. And I've showed you this before, and this is something that we spent hours and hours doing in the. Um, in the stock selection course, not to soft sell you on that, but um, I did. But let me just show you the gist of how I do that every night. First thing I do is I take all stocks, and then I like to sort them by, first start off by sort of by 250K or more. And this gives me my tradable universe. And where I'm going with this is I want to show you what I've been seeing empirically for, for months. So we come down to the last one that's true, and then we flag them all and what time is it now 11 41 uh, eastern 10 41 central so let's see if we could do this in five minutes so we flag all the symbols and we copy them copy them over to a i'm so much slower doing this as i talk we'll copy them over to my what i call tu my tradable universe and then we'll go take a look at the tradable universe. Okay, so there's 3,000 stocks that have an average volume greater than 250K. And the reason I'm looking at 250K and more is number one, so I could trade them 
if I see an opportunity. And number two, I see what's really going on with the market. Okay. But Dave, you just talked about the capitalization thing. Well, 250000 is not that big of a stock. That's a pretty small cap stock. Okay. That's, that's, a, that's almost a micro cap stock. But I do want to make sure it has enough volume to make things meaningful. And the first thing I do, number one, is I sort them by their 52-week highs. And I started doing this about five or six years ago, and I maintained this 100 list of um, the, what I call the Landry 100, which I have to update. I haven't updated in a while. Uh, I had the paper updates, but I haven't updated it. So if you want a copy of it, give me a few weeks to get um, to get everything um, punched in. But what I like to do is look at the stocks that are making brand new highs and look at the makeup of them. Now, these are a couple of buyouts or, or, or stocks that are no longer trading, so that's not, that's not meaningful, and there's another one there. But when you get further down this list, what are we seeing? There's a bond fund. There's a bond fund. Uh, there's kind of a buyout, so we've got to toss that one out. I'm not sure. That's a little buyout or something, so let's toss that out. Another one we need to toss out. Uh, that is a bond fund, okay? And then this, I'm not sure what's going on with that stock. That's a... Uh, Looks like some sort of buyout or something. There's another bond fund, okay? Um, that's a buyout or something. There's a bond fund. There's a bond fund. Some sort of buyout. There's a bond fund. Buyout. Let's see. Now, this is a real estate stock that's making new high, so that's kind of interesting. But what does that tell us? Like I said a second ago, sometimes people look for tangible items, okay? There's another real estate cube. There's a bond fund. There's a bond fund. Some sort of buyout. Uh, throw that out. That's an EPS. Ah, Dr. Pepper. A defensive issue. A big cap issue. Okay. Bond fund. Um, this is a foreign telecom stock. Okay, that's that doesn't really fit what we're looking for. WebMD. That's that doesn't really fit. But it's it's in there. Here's a bond fund. Okay, so there's a, there's obviously some stocks other than bond funds and defensive and foods and REITs in here. But for the most part, the stocks that are high up on the list, the stocks that are leading the market by making new highs, are what defensive related issues. Okay, and these big cap related issues. So it's not a market that's being led higher by a bunch of speculative issues. So we, we've now entered a phase where people want something tangible with their stocks. And then you can see bond fund, bond fund, bond fund, um, REIT or real estate, okay? There's that STC right here, which is what? Foods or drinks, okay? <laughs> Reverse Russell, that's kind of interesting. That's an ETF. I would toss that out, but it is kind of interesting that one of the best performers in the entire bull trade in the entire tradable universe is a reverse ETF on the Russell. So I think you get the idea here. Uh, another bond fund, and you can go further and further down the list. Look, paper company, okay, personal products, toilet paper. So we got toilet paper, real estate, bond funds. And foods, defensive issues, tobacco. So I think I kind of beat the dead horse on that. So that's when looking at the, I guess I went more than five minutes, but that's looking at the 52-week high. So that gives me a feel for what's going on in the overall market. Another REIT, bond funds, okay? So you just ask yourself, look, there's another REIT. What is making up this market? What is leading this market? So you look at this every day. And then what's fascinating is you'll begin to see it change one way or the other as the market turns. So it's a wonderful exercise in and of itself, just looking at all these new highs in here. The next thing I like to do is I sort them by 50-day historical volatility. And then the ones towards the top of the list are going to be too crazy and volatile. But once you get below 100 or so, you start getting an idea of what's going on. And notice downtrend, 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 downtrend. Downtrend, downtrend, downtrend. Just, I mean, come on. Even though I flipped through these really fast, I could see downtrend, 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 downtrend. You get the idea? 
So by looking at all these stocks daily, it tells me what's really going on in the overall market. And, you know, this one's kind of all over the place, uh, thanks to Oprah. But for the most part, most stocks, as you flip through this list, are what? Headed lower. Okay? Down towards the bottom quadrant of this screen. So by going through these stocks, and I go through them about this fast every day, and the software won't keep keep up, but oop, that's when I'm long. Ugh. <laughs> that's nasty. Uh, anyway, <laughs> Uh, or was long, I should say. Laugh to keep them crying there. But most stocks, as you can see, are in downtrend. So this is very important to do this empirical research nightly. Or, of course, you could always pay me to do it for you. The next thing I do is I go back to the entire stock universe. Now, keep in mind, this is in order to walk through this entire process would take several hours. And that's what I did in the, uh, in the course. But I'm just kind of giving you the Reader's Digest here. I then run my pullback scan. Now, my pullback scan and sort them by volatility. These are the most volatile stocks first. It will produce a lot of stocks, and I like it that way because I don't want to miss anything. I'm looking at them all anyway in my tradable universe, but I, I come back and run the scan just in case to see if there's anything that catches my eye. Let me just fix this chart here. I hit the fat finger key so there's a few that are kind of bottoming out in here but th this is like a crazy natural gas um, thing so I would leave that alone but again as I'm going through my possible setups I'm seeing mostly stocks that are in downtrends and not looking so hot so this empirical type of research really helps me to get a feel for what's going on. There are a few stocks in here that are bottoming out that might catch my eye, like that one. Okay, I might come back to that one for a look, although I can tell you right now I wouldn't because it's too much overhead supply. But in going through these, I get a good feel for what's going on in the overall market. And that's all I do for my nightly analysis. It takes a few hours. If I'm not interrupted, like if I'm in a hotel and I'm not getting interrupted, I could, I could actually bang, bang this out pretty quickly, especially if I'm on schedule. But here I stop to answer an email, get a cup of coffee, or uh, whatever, deal with the home issue. Um, and it does end up taking me a few hours. But usually I could, I could actually get this down to, to maybe an hour, hour and a half. But you could see that once you get good at it, you get a pretty good feel for what's going on. You could actually see where the markets are headed up, down, or sideways. Anyway, so that's the analysis. Most of these stocks, as you can see, headed lower, not looking so hot. Okay, I mean, this is a short stock, so notice it's going up. This is an ETF. So the ones that are going up or adverse ETF type of stocks. All right, let's open it up for individual issues. Any questions on anything we talked about so far? Oh, I need to look, we need to look at the market real quick. All right, first of all, um, I just want to show you a couple things in here. In fact, let's look at the major MIGs. If you take a look at the major MIGs, let's first look at the, uh, I guess, look at the S&P. Let's take a look at the P's first. I mean, obviously, we kind of beat the dead horse on them already, but S&P 500, not looking too good recently. Now, we are super duper oversold and due to bounce. So I wouldn't expect, I would not be shocked that this market had the mother of all bounces, but I think it's still in a lot of trouble. We had a bow tie here off of multi-month highs, and then you had, obviously, that weekly bow tie as I've said, ad nauseum, uh, still working in here. And when you look at a weekly chart, you can see it's it's getting pretty scary in here. And never forget that that there are people behind these bars. So if this market begins to drop in earnest, anybody who bought during this range will be looking to get out at break even. So if the market begins to drop, we take out the recent lows in here, and it tries to rally back up, it's going to have a hard time getting back to new highs. Stranger things have happened. The other thing I wanted to point out, which I think I forgot to do, when we were looking at that, that trend bending in the end chart, is that if you go back to 2009, anyone who bought from 2009 on, from March of 2009, so far is a happy camper. But then they're looking at their, they start looking at their statements for 2015, and they're like, wait a minute, I lost money last year. 
And remember, without going into to details, it's Tom McClellan quote and, and the story I often tell about Dick Fruth. People buy and sell stocks for a variety of reasons, okay? And people sometimes sell stocks because they need money, okay? So you got a kid in college, tuition is coming up, coming due, which I know all about. You're like, well, wait a minute. I, I lost money at stocks last year, and I got to pay this $10,000, $20,000, $50,000 tuition bill, whatever the case may be. So you might be under a little pressure to say, wait a minute, if I'm actually losing money over here and I don't want my kid to end up going to a, a lesser school, I better, I, better, I better take some profits or I better lock in some money, okay, before I lose any more. And then, of course, you always have the Johnny-come-latelys, those who just – in 2009, saw the market go up and said, ah, it's still a bad market, 2010, 2011. They keep waiting and waiting and waiting. And finally, in year six or year seven, they finally throw in the towel. Well, let's say they, they threw in a towel year six and bought last year. Well, now they're at a loss. So those last in are often the first out, the so-called fast money. So that's something that's kind of scary in here. Now, if you just take a look at these major MIG groups, there's chemicals. That's a pretty serious slide. Look at the energies banging out brand new lows in here. Uh, we tried to catch a bottom here uh, based on a bow tie. We wouldn't call it catching the bottom. We had the signal. We followed the signal. And it didn't work out. But so what? Nothing venture, nothing gain. Uh, metals and mining banging out new lows. I uh, was bullish on aluminum and steel there. But so far, obviously, that hasn't panned out. No pun intended. Uh, conglomerates, pretty serious slide in here. Now, these are big cap stocks, usually or mostly. So when conglomerates are beginning to fall over, it'll take the market down with them. Durables beginning to slide. Even non-durables, although we saw a few of them that were doing okay, look like they're kind of rolled over in here. Automotive, foods, foods are kind of hanging in there. But look, we could have a week, we could have a daily bow tie here off of all-time highs, and that could be a powerful signal. So even some of those stocks that are high up on the ship. Could begin to implode soon. Take a look at banks. Been imploding here. We're short uh, OZRK in the banks. Um, and you could watch. You could follow along in that delayed service again. Notice that insurance sliding in here. Real estate kind of hanging in there. But I wouldn't rush out and buy some real estate just because it's hanging in there. Okay. Draw your lines. It's going sideways. Drugs are beginning to break down. Aren't drugs supposed to be defensive? Yes. But they're breaking down. And look, you got a weekly bow tie and a major top still in place there, okay? Health services, breaking down with short MOH there. Uh, even uh, aerospace defense stocks, which you think would be doing great right now, given the nature of the world, crazy nature of the world, looks like they're beginning to break down. Manufacturing, breaking down. Material constructions, breaking down, okay? We're looking at one for today as a short. Leisure, breaking down. Media, downtrend. Retail recently made, almost made, all-time highs on the Santa Claus thing. Now beginning to kind of roll over a little bit, but what is it? Sideways. Sideways at best, okay? Especially retail is already tanked, okay? You sort of get the idea in here. Transports, look at that. Bam, abysmal. Take a little weekly chart. There's your bow tie, okay? There's your all-time hot, all-time top in a place, in place until taken out. Well, I think you could safely say, Okay, it's topped, and now you'd be in trailing stop mode there. Uh, computer hardware, okay, or Apple. Look at that, banging out new lows. Computer software, banging out new lows. Bow tied down. Let's take a look weekly. Uh, hasn't uh, bow tied on a weekly yet, but when it does, it's going to be ugly because it's coming off a, a, a double top, okay? Finally, semis are almost finally semis, you can see. Bow tying down, shorter term, longer term. They bow tied down a long time ago on a weekly chart. So this is why I'm bearish. I'm not bearish for the sake of being bearish. I'm bearish because it looks kind of ugly out there. Okay. All right. I've I've I know I've pontificated too much here. All right. Let's get to some questions. Greg says RWLK. Can you talk about whether that strong of a move to quantify quantify or qualify as a first thrust or not? I wish there was a way to make the font bigger. I wish I had an Ellie font on here because the Ellie font is very big. So, all right, let's do that. W-R-W-L-K. 
So the question is, does this quantify as a first thrust? The quick answer is yes, but I would not take this trade. And the reason I wouldn't take this trade is if you go in and watch, I think I even did it in the intro course on um, on stock selection. If you go in and look at the, which I think is on under, I think you could find that on my website here. We talked about, I think I talked about bottle rockets. If I didn't, I know I talked about it in the main course. But if you go to my website and you go to, um, if you go to the stock selection page, there's a, uh, a video there, which goes back to, um, which goes back to my YouTube on it. And the point is that sometimes you get what I call a bottle rocket. Okay. This stock went from, let's see if we can measure it. It went from six to, so it went from six to 17. What's that? 200% uh, move higher in just a few days. And I call it a bottle rocket because sometimes bottle rockets uh, or stocks could act like a bottle rocket. To those of you who weren't, uh, from the south and rednecks uh, like me who play with um, fireworks, a bottle rocket is this little rocket and you put it in a bottle and you light it. And when it takes off, it's like, <sighs> it sounds like it's going to go to the moon, but it fizzles out pretty quickly. Okay. So a lot of times these stocks, will become bottle rockets. And so if you see a two or three hundred percent move or a two hundred percent move over a short period of time, uh, you want to avoid that stock. So if you go here to the uh, stock selection course, in the middle of the page, there's a video and some of these concepts such as uh, bottle rockets are discussed in that video. It should be like a little holy grail comes up or something. So check that out as time allows. So, again, it shot higher. Yeah, it qualifies as the first thrust, but I would not take the trade because it's too dangerous at this point. And the point I was trying to make is a lot of times these bottle rockets go straight up, but then they come right back down. Okay. Man H as a short. Okay. Kind of a long with an answer, but um, I want to show you some additional resources in case I get hit by a beer truck. Kind of low carbon now, so I might not be a problem. Don't worry, I'll get over that soon. <laughs> I'm not holier than now. Let's see if I can float. I can't float this window out. Let's see if we can do this. Okay, man H is a short. Well, it's too late uh, because you had the um, – this was your first thrust signal here. It wasn't a huge first thrust, but you did the bow tie here, and then that's already triggered in here, okay? So I would wait for the next bounce. I mean, that's the problem with the short side is that sometimes they trigger just take off or implode and if you don't get on soon enough then it's too late but i think this one has a long ways to go on the next pullback i think it might be worth a shot but yeah it's, it definitely was a short at least coming off of that bow tie but wait for the next bounce uh, before um looking to take that how did i get my questions back all right, give me one second to get the questions back up and running. There we go. I was trying to make the font bigger. Okay. Deuce, is that how you pronounce your name? What a cool name. Deuce wants to talk about VZ. Okay. Well, it looks like we got some crazy ticks in this one. I guess that was that day we had that crazy market sell-off. Um, what I'm seeing here, maybe I need to zoom in a little bit, see if we can get past that tick. But what I'm seeing here is a stock that's at 45, and I go back in time, a long, long time ago, and it was at 45. And it's, look at the volume on this. So we had two zeros to that. That's 12 million shares a day. So that's a big, thick stock. Now, sometimes I like shorting thick stocks, big, fat stocks. But as a general statement, you want to avoid the more super highly cap stocked stocks and look for inefficiencies in the market. Now, when the market begins to roll over, sometimes those big cap stocks, as I said earlier, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. So you might want to go in and watch that, watch it, read the report, 
called the Gogo Nomo, which was a, a, a report I did on trading these big cap stocks on the short side, these big caps, more efficient stocks. Okay. So I would avoid that because the arrow right now is pointing sideways. All right. Phil wants to know about GG. I bet it's a retrace back to the 50 day moving average. Am I right? Okay. Um, you know, these gold stocks have been really choppy lately and it's kind of a pain because I'm, I'm, I'd love to get on some of them. Uh, it does have some overhead supply. So I would hold off until this one can get up in this range somewhere and then maybe pull back a little bit. But I hear you. It's kind of bottoming out. And I'm seeing some of these uh, like HMY, super speculative uh, gold stocks. I've seen them take off lately. We had a bow tie here. And then, you know, so far so good on that nice little run on that one. But these are very super duper selected, selective, uh, selected stocks within gold. But, yeah. Let's take a gold commodity. I, I meant to do that earlier. At least we're seeing some flight to safety. Sometimes the baby gets thrown out with the bathwater. Sometimes bonds and gold also go down, and then you get like a triple whammy. Stocks, gold, and bonds all go in the same direction. But if you take a look at TLT, which is bonds, it, it has gotten a little bit of a bid lately. Not enough to get excited about, but back to gold. And you can see that we could bow tie up. Now, this could be a major buy signal. And remember, this is one. Remember I said earlier, all major tops will have some kind of signals. So that top going back to 2000 and when exactly did gold top? 2011 is still in place so far. But on a daily basis, it looks like it's trying to turn a corner. But gold is tough to trade sometimes in, or any commodity for that matter. Because a lot of times, as I often say, it's always darkest right before it gets more dark. For instance, USO, uh, we failed miserably trying to catch, I wouldn't say catch a bottom. We had a, we had a buy signal here, and it didn't pan out. Okay, It doesn't always work, as you know. But you can see it's still banging out new lows. So it's way too early to even think about getting along energies just yet. All right, Phil says ABX has cleared supply. This could be another gold stock. That's what American Barrick. Yeah, now that's kind of looking interesting to me, okay? So I'm not a breakout dude, a breakout player, because more often than not, breakouts fail. But now we have a breakout. So first breakout, first pullback after a base breakout, after a big base like this, especially coming off of all-time lows, okay, is, is worthy. And look what we also had back here. Now, it's taking its own sweet time. But we have a bow tie back here. It's triggered about right here. Okay, a liberal stop would have kept you in. And well, what did I just teach and preach earlier? If you could stomach it, put a stop in below the prior lows, okay? And what's happened? So far, so good. You would still be long from this bow tie. You'd have to be very patient, okay? Which few traders have the ability to do, to be patient. But you would still be long from that bow tie. Now, let's take a look at... STRP for once again for Mr. Phil, and then we'll give somebody else a chance. We'll get them all. Don't worry. Okay. Um, long or short on this STRP? I, I, I think I would do neither um, because it just sort of imploded in here, and it's kind of rallied up, and now it looks like it's kind of rolling back over. Uh, if you didn't have this implosion here, then it might, I could see where it might be bottoming out, but I think I would avoid that. It's just kind of all over the place, and you had such a big implosion. Susan, hey, uh, happy New Year, Susan. Good to see you. Oh, happy New Year, everyone, by the way. GT, too late is the question mark. Is that Goodyear Tire? Yeah, now, this is a big, thick stock, but the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Again, um, it's a little choppy, kind of a little all over the place, but I hear you. Um. Yeah, on a bounce, it might be worth a shot, but it is a little all over the place. Yeah, Brett, we talked about man H is a short. The problem with that one is it would have to pull back again. It's already broke it, broke it down. Hello, Steve. These shows are always great, but this one is the best. Oh, thank you, Steve. I appreciate that. Steve, you're the best. Steve's a musician. I'm getting the. I have to. Um, Get some music from him for my uh, marketing and internet and stuff. 
Okay, Terry says, Dave, do you look at the top three to 400 or do you trade entire watch list of tradable universe? Thanks for the info. Miss the first 20 minutes. Will you send out a copy recording? Uh, you post or post on YouTube. Yeah, I'll post it on YouTube. And then in Friday's column, I'll put it in Friday's column. And in Friday's newsletter, I'll put it in Friday's newsletter too. Um, I look at most all of my tradable universe uh, and I sort of by volatility. I, I, you know, when I go, sometimes with, the, the great thing about the new highs is I could whittle out a bunch of stocks quickly that I that I wouldn't trade because they're not set up if there's a lot of new highs. So I'll just keep, keep hitting the space bar. And sometimes I can go through three or 400 new highs that I don't want to actually trade, but I want to see what's going on. And then once I swap out to the uh, historical volatility, um, I'll go through most of the stocks. But when I get way down here, let's say it drops below 20 or whatever, you start getting a lot of stocks that really aren't that tradable. A lot of just choppy stocks and thin stocks. Not not thin, but bigger cap stocks, ETFs and things like that. So I'm not as excited about the stocks that are way down here as I am about stocks that are further up the chain, which could provide more opportunity, okay? Brett says DY is a short. Did we talk about that one? DY. No, it looks good. In fact, that one looks awfully familiar. <laughs> yeah, that's on my list. So uh, let me uh, quickly look away, look away. Can't talk about that one. Yeah, good eye, Brett. RJ says, how would you determine that we are in a bear market, not just a bow tie down that could bounce up? Uh, I don't know. I don't know yet, okay? I don't know for a fact that we are in a bear market. Um my video that I did last summer was how to survive and prosper in the upcoming bear market. And the first thing I said in that video, if you go in and watch your YouTube, it's only about four or five minutes, so it's easy and small and to watch, is the first thing I said is I don't. I don't know that we're not going to bounce back up. But we are in year seven of a bull market. So if I had to bet that the market is running out of steam – I would rather bet in year seven than in year one, okay, or two, or three or four or five or six. And based on everything I just showed empirically, okay, and I guess a little bit in theory too, it looks like the market is in trouble and I'm concerned, okay. But, yeah, you're absolutely right. This thing decides it wants to go on to make new highs, then all bets are off. Then it's not a bear market, okay. I hope it does, but the signs are there, and it's not looking too good at the particular moment. What about using volume? I don't use volume. Um, that's kind of a long-winded answer, but um, how do you know what's buying volume or selling volume, or people are just looking to get out the way, or sometimes markets fall on, on light volume, and that's that could be a very ominous and bearish sign. So... Uh, I have a long with it. If email me, I have a long with it answer on that. I'd be happy to send you. How would you determine that we are in a bear market? Not just a bow tied down. Um, well, I think right now, this, the, you remember, we're a trend follower, okay? So there first has to be a trend to follow. So in looking at all those charts that we just looked at, and specifically, or more specifically, I should say, those major morning and store industry groups, those, what I call the major MIGs, uh, they're not looking too good. We I mean, look no further than the transports. Look at the semis even. Uh, so it doesn't look good. Now, for me to get bullish again, the market or these sectors would have to start making some new highs, either on a, a marginal or not so marginal basis. So one, one day at a time. Ruger, let's take a look at Ruger. Yeah, these gun sales are just... I'm not to confuse the issue with facts, but going through the roof. Um, Ruger looks okay. Um, if you're on a delayed service, you'll notice that I had Smith and Wesson. You'll probably be seeing that one now. I had Smith and Wesson on forever, but unfortunately, is it CH? What is Smith and Wesson? S. I should know it. There it is. Uh, but unfortunately, I took it off the list right before it triggered. Okay, yeah, I'm very happy about that. But we had a TKO here, and then we traded it as a pull. We had it trade as a pullback, but then 
Uh, it just had too many days of the pullback, and then, of course, it takes off. The market doesn't care about me sometimes, you know? Uh, Ruger would definitely be on my radar, but I'd like to see it at least make some new highs in here and get past this prior high before getting too excited, okay? Devendra says, listening to you, I've been a first time, have been following you for 12 years. Oh, what took you so long? <laughs> have all your books, great show. Do you expect bow tie and indices on the next bounce? I missed the first 40 minutes. Okay. Um, well, we could get, yeah, you certainly could get a daily bow tie in the indices. Okay. But that would be what I would call a minor signal. Um, look at this chart getting kind of messy in here. A, a minor signal would be like this would be a minor bow tie buy here, okay? This one right here would be a major sell because it's coming off of all-time highs. So this is a much more important sell signal than this one is a buy signal. So, yeah, we could get a buy signal in here, but it's not going to happen anytime soon. Remember, there's going to be a lot of lag in the bow ties, okay? Right. Sometimes they can be lagging the bow ties. The author's intent or the designer's intent, my intent for the bow tie was to capture more gradual type of rollovers. Um, my first thrust pattern is a little bit better. If, if the market, let's say the market's going along like this and then all of a sudden does that, pulls back a little bit, that's a first thrust, okay? If a market's going along like this and it kind of slowly rolls over and does this, that's going to make a bow tie form, okay? And you might not have this big, sharp, obvious roll over here, but the bow tie will say, hey, Dave or Devendra, let's look at this chart and see what's really going on. And, oh, yeah, longer-term uptrend might still be attacked, but it sure looks like it's rolling over. So for that to happen in the indices, uh, it would take a while because you could see that the always go to price first. So this price would have to start bottoming out and all three of these moving averages would have to turn back up. And that might take a little while. And then also uh, not to get too far into a technical analysis uh, lesson, but as uh, Greg Morris taught me, my good friend, Greg Morris, uh, the exponential moving average will move up when price crosses above it. So for this to turn up, price would actually have to cross above that moving average, okay? So maybe I could show you in a weekly chart. So as soon as price crosses below the exponential moving average, the exponential moving average will turn. So in order for you to get that bow tie, we would have to be way up here, okay? My bad, I was expecting a bow tie in for short. Oh, uh, well, yeah, I mean, most, most areas are beginning to bow tie down and and you, you should you should be seeing some. The only problem is they've already begun. They already have begun to crack. Okay. Susan's still dreaming of me. Well, thank you, Susan. I appreciate that. <laughs> Boy, I hope I don't say Susan in my sleep. My wife will beat me up. <laughs> AEM dreaming of you and gold. Do you think bottoming? Okay. Well, I hope I'm not bottoming, but uh, let's take a look at gold. Yeah, uh, American Eagle, uh, it's a little wide and loose and all over the place. This I would almost play at this point in time as more of a, a pullback play. I would let it get well above maybe even $35 a share. I think with the goals, and they're pretty choppy, I keep an eye on them for, for bottoming patterns. Um, like we talked about the, uh, what was it, American Barrack or whatever a few minutes ago. Would have thought gold would be stronger in the circumstances. Yeah, that's kind of interesting, too. Um, I hear you on that, Susan. The um, You would think that we'd have more of a rally in gold, given the fact that the whole world's coming unglued, given the fact that we could be in the early phases of a bear market, okay, and that, that things are, are generally uh, – <laughs> how do I put it mildly? Not great. How's that? Uh, but, yeah, it's a little bit of a rally in gold, but I agree with you. It, it seems like we should be seeing a little bit more than that. Cliff says, I believe the market's going to go sideways for 10 years. I believe it did this in 70 to 90 period. Well, not so much towards the 90s. I would say 
in the seventies. Yeah. We just chopped it around and chopped it around and chopped it around. Uh, all predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So it's, it's, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't predict that the market will be down in, in, uh, 2016. Although so far it looks like it will be by the end of the year. Uh, but Hey, a lot of stuff could happen between now and then. So I hear you and we could, we certainly could enter, enter some sort of, um, what was the, what was the, what was the basis of the seventies, uh, choppy bull market anybody a choppy sideways market not a bull market was it the um stagflation or something i was actually as old as i am i was not uh, actually trading in the 70s interest rates yeah we had high interest rates and stuff like that oil bad economy yeah there was a lot of there was a lot of things going on i remember interest rates being high it just seems like it was a bleh, time to be in the markets or anything um I remember my father being stressed out quite a bit with his with his business in the seventies and eighties. Um, so yeah, we could certainly enter a period like that. <laughs> Deuces, Democratic president. Well, you know, here's the thing: market actually does better if you want to go in and, and play that game. The market actually does better, or so far, under a Democratic president than it does a Republican president. Now, it would make more sense to do better under a Republican president, being in general, pro-business. But isn't that kind of crazy? It's a little perverse. And that's the problem with markets is you can't confuse the issue with facts. Yeah, but not on the card. Oh. <laughs> Boy, we could we could dig ourselves a hole. I think everyone here is probably on the same team. So it's probably be okay if I started uh, saying something. I remember. I, oh, yeah, yeah. My father, um, uh, being a small business owner, uh, I remember every night he'd come home and, and he'd get sick uh, almost uh, eating dinner because I remember the prime rate. Remember the prime rate was a big deal. I don't know whatever happened to the prime rate, but the prime lending rate was at 21. When it hit 21 percent, he just put his fork down one night. I'm like, I never forget that. We were that was a stressful time. Uh, I remember as a, as a kid uh, watching my father uh, stress out over interest rates. So, yeah, it was um, those are certainly tough times. Amen to that. Giving away my age. <laughs> Oh. Susan, are you a cougar? <laughs> Interest rates on homes was 18%. How crazy is that? Carol says oil going up. Let's take a look at that. Well, not much, huh? You talk about USO? <laughs> Roar for you only. <laughs> You're going to get me out of trouble here, Susan. <laughs> oh, not in the 70s. Okay, got you. Oil was going up in the 70s, yeah. Dave, you announced your birthday a few days ago. We know how you are. Yeah. Happy New Year. Thank you, Howard. All right, Mux for Steve. Did we talk about that one? Yeah, it looks good. Uh, as far as trend is concerned, uh, this is industrial metals and mining. It is uh, it's decent volume. It looks like the mother of all bottoms is in place here. Yeah, good eye. I think on pullbacks, it'd be okay. I'm a little bit more lenient when it comes to something like a metal and mining, especially, especially now since they've been so choppy and all. But, yeah, that looks pretty good. They bottomed out uh, on the next pullback, Steve, absolutely. Lots of money has been going into MLPs like MMP. P? Um, it's a pipeline now. MLPs. What's an MLP? Uh, that actually looks okay. I mean, every there's not a whole lot to get excited about right now. It's coming off of multi-year lows. If it was coming off of all-time lows, I'd be a little bit more excited. But I'd give that one an okay. It's kind of a choppy in here, but you did bow tie a little bit and. I personally would trade it, but you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Too many days in, in the pullback to get excited about. Brett says, would I be able to short TSS if it pulls back? Uh, let's take a look at that. Yeah, absolutely. I think it looks good. Uh, you got good volume, million and a half. Uh, it's just beginning to crack, okay? Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Uh, yeah, on a pullback, I think it'd be worthwhile. You got a little support back here, but I wouldn't worry about that too much. Absolutely, on a pullback, keep that one on your list. What do you think about UNG? This could be what gas? UNG. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Um, now, obviously, it's triggering, I guess, on the first thrust today, but absolutely keep an eye on that. Uh, natural gas, I think, uh, boy, it just seems like this is taking forever to bounce, huh? But yeah, that's, uh, I got a client that emails me every now and then about gas. Like, uh, is it time? Is it time? No, not yet. But yeah, it looks like it's trying to turn a corner. I agree. But I would wait for um, a setup. Maybe like CRC, California Resources Corp, is in an accumulation phase, gas sector, for Francesco. All right, let's take a look at that one. CRC. Well, it's a little, you're a little too early on that one, okay? You're banging out brand new lows. I wouldn't call that accumulation. Uh, that's a case where you want to draw your arrow for now, okay? And so far, it looks like it's headed lower. Um. Now, if there was a way to know that this stock would never go out of business, which you don't, so it's just, I'm just speaking hypotheticals, and, and what would the world be without hypothetical questions? But if you knew that there was, there would be some sort of in use for their oil or whatever they have, then you could buy it, and it would be like a, a put that, ne I'll call a put, listen to me, <laughs> Freudian slip, a call that never expires. But you don't. So I would not bottom fish in a stock that's hitting brand new lows. So let it bottom out and then wait for a rally. Are oh, you welcome, Devendra? I hope I got your name right. Okay. Okay, we've got a few more minutes. Any more questions? Good bunch today. Great bunch. Thank you guys and girls for coming. I appreciate you taking time and your busy schedule to be here. Okay, did we look at VZ for you? Yeah, we looked at that. Let's take a note. Yeah, it's sideways, Deuce, uh, on the VZ. You want to take a look at Mo? Uh, Mo's sideways, too. That's cigarettes. She smells, she tastes like cigarettes. <laughs> um, when I used to have books on, on here, I would um, do a trivia contest. and be like, what reference was I making? In minute, uh, hour, and twenty, twenty fourth minute in my service, in my um, weekend charts, that probably made no sense. I used to do a trivia contests back when I had a stack of books in my office and give away books to uh, people who got the trivia. Um, no, it's sideways. I'd let it make new highs before getting too excited. Thanks. I look forward every Thursday to your comments. Oh, you're welcome, Cliff. Appreciate that. Okay, silver's outperforming gold according to Phil, which I will not doubt because Phil. Knows what he's doing. Let's take a look at SIL. Yeah, silver could be a little bit more squirrely. It seats uh, 38 is the HV. Let's take a look at the GLD and 14. Okay, so silver, according to the ETF at least, is three times more volatile than gold. I, I have a love-hate re relationship with silver, and whenever I say something like that, I have a friend of mine always says, you love it and hate your account, and that's often the case. But let me tell you something. When silver goes, man, it can go. Uh, silver looks interesting in here, but only if it begins to bow tie up and or just has a big thrust off of lows and a pullback. Maybe if we can get up to 21, 22 and pull back, it might be worthwhile. Um, I hear you, but I wouldn't get too caught up in the day-to-day -day action because silver is so much more volatile. Good info today. Oh, you're welcome, Jim. Appreciate that. PMs are an uptrend. How often has that been the case recent past? When PMs, what's a PM, Phil? Silver means silver miners, not the bullion. Oh, SLV is silver. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, same sort of pattern there, too, though. Uh, you know, so everything I just said, in fact, the miners look like they're trying to buy them out in here. Let's take a look at the SLV. You're right. I was wondering why it was so thin. Oops. Okay, 19. Well, it's still it's still 50% higher. Uh and yeah, decent, decent day there too, but it's going to have to get up here or somewhere before we get excited. Sorry about that uh, mix-up. Oh, precious metals. Okay. 
Good, good, uh, good catch, Dan. Oh, happy new year, YouTube, Brett. That'll work. Okay, you're welcome, Devendra. Okay, Howard wants to know about Rick. We've got time for one or two more. Yeah, that's a gold miner. It's a little bit on the thin side, but uh, yeah, certainly making the mother of all bases. Certainly, probably the, one of the better looking uh, gold stocks out there. So on a pullback, absolutely, um, it might be worth a shot. Okay, looks like uh, looks like that. That's it. Uh, I want to thank everybody for oh, ironic Chinese. They're cheating, right? Ironic Chinese say you may live in interesting times. They are creating them for us. <laughs> I'll be in China soon. Uh, I'll ask him. Uh, actually, uh, Hong Kong. Thanks for the RSP and capitalization lesson. Oh, you're welcome. Happy New Year to you too, Leon. All right, I guess we'll go ahead and wrap things up again. I have a blast doing these shows. I love what I do, and and I and what makes it possible is you guys and girls. Uh, showing up each week. Without you, obviously, there's no show. So it uh, looks like we broke another record this week. So I'm I'm excited to start the new year off this way. I'm on a, a high right now. So I appreciate that. Uh, everybody have a fantastic weekend. If we don't talk again, anything unanswered, daviddavelandry.com. Shoot me an email. I'll be happy to answer it. And if not, um, I'll see you guys and girls again next week. Thank you so much.